You're listening to Curiosity Invited with David Bryan here on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello, my name is David Bryan, and this is Curiosity Invited, a podcast inspired by endless curiosity. Tune in for an open-minded conversation about interesting and important things. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Curiosity Invited. My name is David Bryan, and I have the great pleasure of speaking to a young man, uh, not quite as young as when I first met him, Matt Van Horn. Matt Van Horn is an American entrepreneur and the CEO and co-founder of June, uh, maker of the June Intelligent Oven. Previously, he co-founded Zimride, now called the ride-sharing service that you've all heard about, Lyft was the vice president of business at PATH, P-A-T-H, PATH, and ran partnerships at DIG. He also worked at Apple while attending college, something I remember, um, where he was uh, uh, Apple's higher education marketer for the school. And um, Matt, thank you for being here. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for giving up your time. I know you're glued to the telephone, to the screen all day. Um, and... Uh, and thanks. So, what's left out of that? What's left out of that bio that's worth saying? Uh, I'm probably all the times I probably should have been expelled from school by you, but because <laughs> it was you, you kept giving me a second chance. So, thank you for did, allowing me to do some of those things. Did Did you do Did you do things that were expellable? Uh, no, not intentionally. Like I was, I don't know. Like I, 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 I've always thought of you like me. Like I my friends group we were like harry potter and ron weasley and like and you were dumbledore and it's not like they were bad kids that should have been expelled but like they should have been expelled for some of the things they kind of did by accident because of (laughs) other stuff that happened so we we were like that i think yeah you were you were quite quite a crowd i mean I, i will tell you i remember vividly um You know, it does not surprise me, and I want to ask you about being an entrepreneur, but it does not surprise me that that's what you are, or that that's what you've done, um, because you did that then. Was I was the first person I knew with a CD burner, and so I could, this was like sorcery, I could take MP3s and make my own playlists, like this hadn't been done since like the, the tape cassette. Yes, uh, yes. And then I was able, and then back then people didn't have MP3s. And so the fact that I could curate like a 15 song CD and then sell that at school like that. And I would sell it for like 20 bucks, which is like the cost of a CD because I was curating all the best singles. Yeah. And so that, that was a good business. And, but I think I remember shutting something down before that. It was really, I think it was in middle school. And, and I, I loved it because you, you looked at me and you said, well, wh- why? Why not? And it was like, I didn't have a, I mean, I, to, to this day, I didn't have a really great answer. And, uh, but I so appreciate it. So the fact that you're, you know, starting businesses and building businesses is like, well, of course, what else is he going to do? That's, he was born with that. You were thinking in that direction as a little kid. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. One, one, one thing that I haven't quite figured out, maybe you can you can diagnose me today with my, my problem. Cause I know I have cool. a problem, uh, <laughs> but so I actually thought I didn't have money and like, didn't, like thought I was like middle, middle class, right? For sure. Until I attended New Roads for the first time <laughs> and found out that I like, wasn't the poorest person that I knew, which living in the bubble of Pacific Palisades, I kind of was, which was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I didn't even know I was rich until like, uh, until way later, until I was like 14 years old, which is crazy, right? So I, again, but I, I I was never motivated by money and all the companies and web pages and you know bootysmack.com and all these these <laughs> little web projects that Logan Hess and I would would create. Like we just like building stuff and like starting things, and so we that that was always the motivation. It was never about like, okay, how can we make a quick buck so I can like buy something? Like I right. literally never crossed my mind. And even with companies that we started later in life, like it was just about building cool stuff. It's just another web project. And so I, I think I liked the dream of 
like just making things more than like, ooh, I want to make money and like, yeah. I got to flip this and turn this. And that's why a lot of like boring businesses have never appealed to me because I kind of want to do something insane and crazy. And like, we don't want to talk about June right now, but like with, with June, Nikhil and I, we decided we're going to start an appliance company from scratch. None of, none of us have ever worked on an appliance. We know nothing about the industry. We have no ability to make hardware or manufacture. And we're just, we have this idea and we're going to will it into existence because we want this thing in our home. Do, and do maybe think, a good business will come later. And do you think that the, the interesting, the stuff you did before June, was that, did you, do you see, that you look back and sort of see that as preparation? Or, or June really was just like a bolt of lightning just because you, well, what? In fact, talk about that. Like, where did that bolt of lightning come from? Or did you just want, <laughs> you just want to cook? Sure. So I'll, I'll go back a little bit to yeah. a little bit of the, the Zibride story a bit, and then I'll kind of parlay that into yeah. how, how I've thought about my, my career. So, um, so in high school and college, uh, my best friends and I, uh, Logan and Heston, who I was with this past weekend, even now we're, we're old and 30, 38 years old, oh, God. but we've been like best friends since like, honestly, seventh, eighth grade. So we're 13, 14 years old. And uh, we were always Trouble starting little troublemakers right from the beginning. No, actually yes. great, great fun students, but always doing something. <laughs> yes. Thank you yeah. again for not expelling us, but, <laughs> but from, so we were always starting little web companies, projects and things like that throughout time. And uh, Logan and I were backpacking in Africa one summer in college. We were in Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe. And one of the things that, that Logan noticed was in Zimbabwe, the economy was so bad that everyone was only driving their car if every seat was filled and everyone was paying gas money. And so like when we like go took our ride to the airport, the car had no gasoline in it. It had just enough to get to the guy with gasoline. And they're like, are you sure you don't want to fill this extra seat up in this car? There's one additional seat. And we're like, no, we're, we're okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll pay for that. Um, and so this kind of lightning bolt came to Logan. He's like, how do I fill empty seats in cars back in California? And so we started this company called Zimride, named after Zimbabwe. And it was, was always Logan's baby. And I was just along for the ride. But again, we weren't trying to make money. We weren't trying to like start a company. Like we just wanted to make another fun, cool thing that we thought would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Fill empty seats in cars. And then um, we're, we're still like end of college and then graduation. Uh, we were trying to figure out kind of our post-college plan. And we were trying to raise money. And I was sending cold messages to people on Facebook saying like, hello, would you like to meet with our transportation startup and give us money? And no one would take us seriously at the time. And I remember there, there was this one meeting where um, this guy reached out to us, was a director at eBay, this guy, Sean Argawal, and said like, hello, I would like to invest in Zimride. And Logan, I'm like, like, why would someone want to invest in this thing? Like, this has got to be a scam. This person's going to take money from us. And so we met him at a public place at Togo's in Fremont. So he didn't like take our wallets and fast. <laughs> Fast forward, he was totally legit and he liked the product. And he wrote the first check to Zimride. And uh, fast forward, he's, I believe he's chairman of the board of Lyft. Oh, okay. is that right? <laughs> he took Truly Up public. He was an investor in June. Like he's a super legit, incredible That's person. That's great. Uh, but anyway, but, but back then, other than Sean, no one believed in us. And so I said to Logan, I said, hey, this is your baby. Uh, I'm clearly not ready to start a company because that, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to, to start things, build things. I'm not ready. This is not my time. This is not my company. What, what, I wait, slow go. down, slow down. When you say yeah. you not you were, you were not ready, what do you mean? You mean you felt like you just, you didn't have the skills? You didn't have the what was missing? It's so like the, there's this like moment as a entrepreneur where you need either third party validation that you should keep doing something or you just have that intrinsic drive that like this is your life's work and nothing else matters and you will just fail right. and right. have no income and be you know not gather develop any skills yes. other than the right. struggling along the way skills 
Right. And so for me at that time with Zimride, I needed validation, right? For Logan, he had to build this thing. It was his baby. He was obsessed with transportation. He had he to was keep obsessed. going. For he really me, was, yeah. I, I was along for the ride and it was mm -hmm. fun, but it was that time I was like, okay, well, it doesn't seem to be my time to be mm -hmm. an entrepreneur yet. And so I said, I want to go learn from other entrepreneurs. And so I made a list of my top 10 favorite companies at the time. So this is 2007. So this is like Web 2.0 is about to start. Right. And, and I said, I'm just going to bother the CEOs and founders of all these companies until they hire me. And so I kind of decided, I, I call it getting my, my MBA in startups. I don't have an MBA, but it's like my, getting my MBA in startups. So I reached out to this company called Dig, which is started by this founder, Kevin Rose. And um, who today is, is famous for everything he's doing in the NFT crypto space. Possible. And I was a little bit insane. I would arrive at usually seven o'clock in the morning. I would leave usually nine o'clock at night. My now wife was in law school, which was like amazing for this period of life because she had no time for me. And so uh, it was it was great <laughs> that I was able to work all the time and I loved it. And then, um, and then my old boss from Apple reached out to me and said he was starting a new company called Path to try and take down Facebook with a bunch of ex-Facebook Apple people. And I was like, sounds crazy. I like crazy. Let's, let's do it. And again, this company, Dave Moore, incredible entrepreneur, uh, and Sean Fanning and Dustin Miro, uh, Sean Fanning, founder of Napster. Yeah. Uh, and then, but I, I got to be Dave's right-hand person and learn from the craziness of that. We, at one point we had Google offered us a hundred million dollars to sell the company when we were 12 people in Fanning's apartment. We had zero users, zero customers. We ended up turning it down. I like negotiated that whole deal. Like I had no idea what I was doing. Like it was a crazy learning experience. And turned it down because, because he thought there was a pot of gold at the end of that. Like he yeah. was still, yeah. Ab still absolutely. Mind. I mean, we hadn't, we hadn't launched yet. It's kind of like, again, yeah. like there's the different entrepreneurs dilemmas back to that, like validation versus like intrinsic thing. Like yeah. validation, Google wants to buy you for a hundred million. Sure. But you're like, okay, well, and Instagram hadn't sold yeah. for a billion dollars yet. But when right. Instagram for a billion came out, that was, bananas and instagram's worth a lot more than a billion dollars today so it actually was a bad deal if you like you look at how right. much market cap right. value it's yeah, sure. uh, it was one of the best things to ever happen to me because a few months later my co-founder of june nikhil left apple to join path we had a lot of expat ex apple people at path and so the two of us got to meet which then later led to the, the journey that that became mm -hmm. so how did you know how did you know when it was your time so for, first we became obsessed with the idea of, of wanting to work together. And so we went for a walk and it's like, what would starting a company look like? And you're both still at, Correct. at path. Yep. yep. We're both still at path. Got it. And so we, um, and then, so we started spending a lot of time in my apartment and his apartment, just thinking like, okay. You wanted to start a company. You wanted to work with this guy starting a company, because, yes. but the, but the, what it was came next. This was Didn't just matter. about yes. started. This he, was the, this was the moment. This was going to be your yes. baby. Yes. And so for wow, the only requirement that we had was so my my last two startups that I worked at, Path and Dig, neither made money. Like they were both free services that would figure out how to monetize later, similar to like Facebook or Twitter. Right. So like okay, we'll figure out advertising later. And right. Some do, some don't. And so the one requirement we had was that the day we launched, announced what we were doing, we had to make money, whatever that means. We could have done a social software that we charged for, or it could have been right. a hardware product that we charged for. But like we had to collect credit cards the day we launched. That was the only requirement. And so anyways, and Nikhil uh, had worked at Apple and worked on the secret project, which- As a software engineer? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he was recruited to the camera team on the iPhone one. So the original iPhone camera. So <laughs> Nikhil went on and invented a lot of Apple's core camera technology. So tap to focus, instant shutter, uh, panorama. So he literally invented. Um, um, and so we're, again, we're, we're spending lots of time, my place, his place, trying to come up with the idea. It just has to make money. That's the only requirement. <laughs> and we start to get hungry late at night and we'd start cooking. We start cooking like very simple meals, like egg waffles. And then one time I remember we were stuffing Cornish game hens 
I remember Lauren came home once and she's like, what the heck are you guys doing? She comes and like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be working your business today. Why are you guys just cooking? We're like, hold on, we might be onto something. And we had this little toaster oven and we had this terrible looking built, it was a fancy apartment, like downtown San Francisco apartment with like a really nice oven. And it was, it was, it was garbage. It was not a good oven. The interface didn't make sense. I was afraid of it. I never used it. And for us, we loved great products, high quality design, big Apple nerds. Yes. Uh, we're very inspired by what Tesla was doing at the time. And we said, we looked at the industry and we said, no one seems to be innovating in this kind of old school appliance industry. Why not us? And there are 10,000 reasons why not us. But we just put on those entrepreneur blinders of all the reasons we shouldn't do this. And we willed our way from one challenge to the next until was, was, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through the experience. So it's a, it's a, it's a countertop oven uh, that you could fit, you know, you can do toast in, but you can also fit two large chickens in at the same time. Just to kind of, and so um, we have a camera that sits on the top and we have a touchscreen that sits on the front and the experience of, so I, I, I did uh, whole chicken with sweet potato and um, Brussels sprouts this week. And so I just put that on the June pan. I haven't even turned on the June. I put it in, I close the door and it says, I see whole chicken. Uh, would, would you like to cook it the same way as last time? And you just say, yes. And then we recognize what the food was. We've invented the world's first like food identification algorithm for appliances. And then um, we then run a multi-step cook program for this. So on our chicken, we actually run this mode called virtual rotisserie where if you think about what a rotisserie is, is you move, there's one heating source and then you move the meat around. Yes. But if you're able to automate an appliance, if you're able to automate an oven, um, we were able to, with our six heating elements, create a virtual rotisserie. So instead of moving the meat, the chicken is not moving. We move the heating elements in terms of turning on the light. I mean, these carbon fiber heating elements, they're full power in three seconds. It's able to emulate that in software. How long did it take you guys to go from, hey, I've got an idea, let's build the oven to yeah. launch? Yeah, so we, we quit our jobs and started the company October 2013. You quit our jobs means you've had some, some way of surviving. Uh, we didn't know that then. We luckily had employed wives. That's uh, good, yes. Normal jobs so employed we were, wives we were, who, who liked you <laughs> yeah so we we calculated we could probably go like three months without a paycheck type of thing at the time yeah um and then so that was october 2013 and then june 9th 2015 so that's about two years later um we didn't ship don't 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 get ahead of us let's not get ahead of ourselves here but june 9th 2015, we announced to the world what we were doing. Uh, but a few months later, we actually demoed on stage at the Wall Street Journal conference, the first live demo of the June oven. And so that was so about two years to be able to demo something. And then probably another year and a half to ship first product. And how long between inception of let's do this to you raise some money because, you know, you, to build a team of 25 before you, before anything sold. Yep. Right. So how, so I mean, with that, obviously that process, well, you know, that process is usually grueling, right? You know, so like yep. everybody it's no, 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 no. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. Was it, was it that for you? So one of the, the things that if I go back to trying to think about fundraising with, with Logan and, and Zimright in the beginning is I didn't want to go, I didn't want to be an outsider this time, if that makes sense, like a Silicon Valley outsider. I wanted to be an insider and I, I wanted this moment to be easy. It wasn't easy, but it wasn't as hard as it would have been otherwise. And so, like I kind of said, my, my MBA in, in startups over that six year period I was very fortunate that I was able to meet and get to know a lot of digs investors, a lot of past mm -hmm. investors, a lot of folks within the industry. Mm -hmm. And so 
once, so in, in the early days, we hadn't uh, raised money. And like the first like three months, we wanted to kind of have something to show, um, just like a, a document with like some beautiful industrial design and uh, a little yeah. pitch deck. Yeah. And so we, we had the pitch deck and we went out and like, we almost couldn't say it with a straight face. We're like, we're looking to raise $5 million, like <laughs> saying if they would take us seriously. And, uh, and people said, yes, I like, guess we're, we're interested. Um, and so we were very fortunate that uh, First Round Capital said, they, they called me up. They said, uh, Matt, you're insane, but Nikhil seems smart. So we're in. And then once we had that validation of First Round Capital, one of, you know, if not the uh, most, most important uh, seed investor, yeah. Uh, at the time, then other people were like, oh, I want to get in this. What is this? Like the future of cooking, this, the future of Smart Kitchen. Yeah. And then we were very fortunate to get connected with Foundry Group out of Boulder. And Jason Mendelson uh, was was single at the time. And he was like, man, this would have like made my life so much better. <laughs> Bachelor mode, like I would have looked like a superstar. And so we ended up raising a $7 million round out the gate off of oh, a, off of a keynote presentation. Like we had yeah. no oven. We had no demo. We had Nikhil and I and a crazy idea. And so we were very lucky and fortunate that actually that's, pretty, that's a really... pretty easily we were able to raise that. And again, we got plenty of rejections. And later rounds, we got almost 100% no's, but it was never 100%. But like that first round, just the insanity of our idea, the, the, the quality of the potential combo of Nikhil and I made people excited about it. And, and perhaps also the, the time. It was, you know, it was the it was the beginning of the smart everything right mm -hmm. yeah and, the, and uh, people recognized that something was coming they didn't know what it was going to be yep but yeah and that's and, great. and for us kind of a part of our original story that we we knew we had to make up for our weaknesses so i'd say our two biggest weaknesses were we had no hardware legitimacy even though Nikhil worked on iphones he worked on the software side yeah and uh, so we had no like hardware manufacturing experience. And then we also had no culinary legitimacy. So those, oh. those two things. And so kind of the, the, the first two uh, folks that were, or three folks that were most important to get on board was one, we needed some legitimacy in the culinary space. And so we got connected to Chef Michael Mina, a Michelin starred chef in, in the Bay Area. And th thank you, Carl, for the introduction there and uh michael was like i get it i want to help i want to be a part of this so we suddenly had a slide with michael mina on it and um and then uh, matt rogers so kind of the back to the connected devices at the time um nest was like the company tony fidel oh, and, yes. and matt rogers and I, I i didn't know tony very well at the time i know him better now but uh, matt rogers said he loved what we were doing and was going to invest and, try, and then the, the third person was this guy liam casey who's known as mr china there's really interesting articles about him and Liam just was the, the earliest, most excited supporter of us. And he's very lucky and also uh, very skilled, right? I mean, it, it, it sounds like, you know, it didn't just fall in your lap. You, 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 there was strategy there, right? I mean, even, even though you didn't know what it was going to be strategy for, you know, that, that piece about meeting everybody you possibly could while you were at DIG or PATH or, or both. And, oh. and I mean, I love that. I love that. Not, it's a different experience being, raising money from the inside than from who are these guys? And like, what have you ever done? I understand the impetus to have your own baby, but I, I get that. And I get that it's, I get that it takes uh, a sort of obsession drive, right? And question, there's a question like, you know, for lack of a better, it's like Kenny Rogers, Kenny Rogers question, like, you know, you know, when to hold them, when, when to fold them. <laughs> and, and so how did you know at all? I mean, was the first round so, um, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to throw it away like it was easy, but was the first round being easier than it could have been? Uh, was that like wind behind your back pushing you forward oh, so that it Oh, for it sure. Helped? Yeah. Oh yeah. So like, you know, your ego goes through the roof at that point, right? When yeah. you've got this amazing validation, but don't worry, there, there are people that bring you back down to earth with all the rejection that, <laughs> that comes in later rounds. 
Um, and, so, and is that is that a is that a common is that a common uh, phenomenon that somehow the first round is easier than the I, next and the I, next it, rounds are very binary. So we raised four rounds of funding for June. The 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 first round, the seven million dollar round, was shockingly easy because there's a lot of money for good teams, and it doesn't even matter what the idea is, right? Yeah. So like a good yeah. team you know, legitimate inventor from Apple, this crazy guy, Matt, who seems to know a bunch of people um, and has, you know, experience with Zimride and Lyft. Yeah. Um, like, here, here's some money. Like, we might lose it, but like, good teams are hard to come by versus right. like, good right. ideas, like with an unknown team is, is worse, if that makes right. sense. Right. Um, and then at the late stage, we'll talk about the last round we had. So our last round was led by Weber. And so that was our largest round of funding. And they, they led that round and there was attached to it was a huge strategic partnership where they were paying us per grill that had June technology on it. So this is before they bought us. So they, they later bought us is the kind of punchline on yes. this. But, but yeah, three years before they bought about us, that in a second, yeah. they, they, they led our round of funding. And so that round with this uh, incredible validation and guaranteed revenue on a per grill sold basis, that round was really easy to raise. Right. Because we had a strategic and yeah. we created a whole new business model for ourselves where we weren't just selling boxes. Yes, exactly. Individual ovens anymore. We were able to sell this per unit software licensing. To, to the largest and, grill company in the universe, right? Yeah. Totally. And so, so what's interesting is, so the first round, pretty easy. The last round, pretty easy. Those, those other two, like almost Brutal. death, almost really? death, like, like shutting down, laying everyone off death on wow. both of them at, at, at times. Wow. And, um, and we, we somehow persevered, but I, to answer your question, I would say it's very binary. It's either really, really easy generally mm -hmm. or really, really hard. So Weber sort of reapproaches you or approaches you and says, mm -hmm. like, we want, we want it. And they're like, well, you already got it. No, no, no. We want it. Mm -hmm the whole thing and that was that worked out and you you guys sold to it and and you're still i mean yep. i don't know how it's organized yet right you know you're still a is it its own division or is it is it a division of weber or is it a joint venture or is it whatever however you've structured it you're still the ceo of it yeah or so is that? the, way, the way, way to think about it is weber acquired 100 percent of the company yeah uh, and june Think of it as its own like independent brand within Weber. So they're kind yeah. of the the June oven is the product within this brand of June. And so I run that. And then Nikhil runs connected devices, which is tied to now any smart product that Weber or June makes, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. And so we've announced a series of smart grills that are in the market now, gas grills, pellet grills. Uh, and so that's mm -hmm. June technology, which is now Weber technology yes. um, that powers those those products. So do you feel like your baby is no longer your baby? Uh, maybe if I didn't run June still, but luckily I do, which is really, really nice. Right. And so, you know, I, I think the uh, the impact I have on the overall picture, right, when like my stuff is the most important thing at June, like June, we're, we're still small within Weber. Right. So it's sure. uh, it's a different perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, I'm I'm very lucky and fortunate that I get to think about June. I'll call it 90 percent of the day. I'm spending some time on grill stuff, still thinking about kill, obviously. But uh, yeah, so it, it's amazing that I, I get to still focus and, and work on that. And another really nice thing about remote work. So we, we announced early in the pandemic that no one ever had to come to the office again that they can move anywhere in the world. We had someone move to Portugal. We had someone moving to Japan. We hired our first engineer in Brazil. And, and uh, a lot of people were, were able to move different places. Uh, I, I moved to Seattle from San Francisco. And um, what's, what's something that's really nice about remote culture is I think the office vibe didn't change post acquisition because there's no office. That makes mm -hmm. any sense. Like I think it would have been worse in a non-remote time Right. Uh, to have done the acquisition, but we were already remote for a year um, when the acquisition happened. And so it's honestly been, it's worked out really well in that sense. Yeah. You went to, when you went to college, mm -hmm. you studied, as I recall, maybe, you know, I could have this wrong, 
did you study entrepreneurship in, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine opening a textbook and, and, uh, and getting an education in that. It seems like that, that, that the learning that's needed for, for the thing that you're doing or that you've done is one of those things, not it can't be supplemented with textbooks and, and courses and whatever, but, but it's almost like you can only learn that on the ground in the, like, you know, sure. hands in the dirt, right? Yeah, so, I mean, Am I wrong about that? So there's, uh, there's a quote I like, I have no idea where it's from, it's not from me. It's like, don't let your schooling get in the way of your education. Oh, yeah, well, that's Mark Twain. <laughs> I think <laughs> Mark that's Twain. Mark Twain. Yeah. Uh, it's a really so, damn good story. <laughs> damn good quote. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, for me, so in high school, I was just like a business nerd. I'd read like Fast Company and stuff like that just because I, I liked it. Yeah. And, uh, and so I decided as a junior to go to University of Arizona because they had a top three entrepreneurship program where your senior year, you start a company and you go to like a pitch competition, like Shark Tank style, like pre Shark Tank, but like yeah, that yeah. type of pitch competition. And some people go on and start their businesses. Others go and get jobs. You'd already done that in high school, hadn't you? With the business uh, class? I don't know. Was there a business class at New Roads? Yeah. We say it was with a, you know, you start a company and you have a team and you, there, there's a Shark Tank event. I, I, maybe it was, maybe have, it was after you. Maybe you inspired I think it. Was after it. me. You yeah, might have inspired I, I, I did not participate in this, yeah. but uh, anyway, so in high school, I show up and I get a meeting with the Dean of the University of Arizona Business School. And I'm like, hello, I'm coming here to come to your entrepreneurship program. I'm like, can you pre-accept me? And I was a junior in high school. And he's like, uh, we accept you as a junior in college. I'm like, I don't know <laughs> what you're doing here. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll be back. You'll accept me, thanks. And then <laughs> fast, fast forward, I, uh, I was not a good student at, um, uh, in, in college because again, back to the, the, the quote, like other things were, were, were filling my cup more like I, so anyway, fast forward, so I'm a junior year, I'm applying to my dream program, where I get to, you know, start this company and study entrepreneurship. And uh, I don't get in. You don't so, get in? <laughs> I don't get in. So after, after all that, uh, I don't get in. But two, two of my friends, got in and they both were perfect students uh they were not as entrepreneurial as me but they were perfect students so they got in and so they were going to orientation which is where like you chose your teammate and started yeah. working on your ideas yeah. and so i was like i'm just gonna go and so i didn't ask for permission i just showed up at orientation and uh there was one software engineer in the whole room i immediately went towards that person it's like we're on the same team way and uh, and then found an incredible finance person and marketing person, and they elected me like GM or CEO of our team. And then afterwards, the people that managed the program, they were like, uh, "Matt, what are you doing here?" Uh, I'm like, "Oh, well, I really want to be here." They're like, "Are you going to work really hard?" I'm like, "Yes." I'm like, "Okay, you're in." And so they <laughs> they they accepted me. Um, so so did you? Do you feel like you learned stuff? Well, I, I don't want you to talk badly about your college or anything else, but but but. Did you get a sense that was that was that a valuable thing to be doing? It was. And... It, it was. It was awesome. And what what's really interesting is it it brought earlier in my life that like need for third party validation versus that intrinsic motivation. Like I was able to experience that still as a student. Right? So again, I had the moment later. It's not much later. Like a year yeah. and a half, two years later, with yeah. with Logan as. Um, you said something that that quote, right? Don't let your education get in the way of your. So, do you think your education, whether it was college, you know, there was a certain. I re, I, I remember this. There was a certain, you know, because I did it, but fanning the flames, trying to keep the reins on you guys, and at the same time fanning the flames of your enthusiasm, you know all three of you wanted to do things that didn't, you know, that weren't on the list of, you can take this, you can take this, and you can take this. And, uh, and you know, my attitude was always, well, somebody wants something, a student wants something, you know, you don't want to stand in the way of it. You want to encourage it, right? And so even if it was something like Booty Smack, and <laughs> whatever, which was that crazy website, um, 
But do you think that there are, do you think your education played a role in, in sort of either giving you the, whether it's the skills, the emotional impetus, the enthusiasm, the, the validation or affirmation, or was, or is school, has school mostly been, don't let your education get in the way of your, of your learning or but whatever it is don't let school get in the way of your yeah. education so, so you and new roads fostered something magical and I, I don't know how to describe it and it wasn't the the weird hippie people you had talked to us at different things or the the person that came and showed me slaughterhouse videos and made me vegan for two weeks till my mom called you up and said like uh david he needs to eat food again he's gonna like lose all the weight he has and he doesn't have any um so like again like there, there was there was something unique and wonderful to that obviously that was interesting but um i think that it was just such a different and unique environment that like people felt comfortable being themselves and doing weird things and i, I don't know how you like create this holistically but like if we had a crazy idea like we would just come to you and be like hey can we do this like like for you guys had high speed internet and we were too you know didn't have enough money to pay for high speed internet to plug our server in and so we're like hey can we just like plug into your internet and we don't know why you said yes you've told me later why you said yes you wanted the ability to unplug it <laughs> yes i was not just being naive i mean the truth is that like you know bracket for a moment footnote the truth is that is that like in the school world, every school was wringing their hands, having was like over what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do? Because there was all this free speech issues and there was, you know, like standing in the way of how, how do we control it if if it's, you know, they're doing it on their own and all that stuff. So when you guys came to me, it was like, well, this is a win win because I certainly don't want to get in the way of your exploring stuff. And, and yet I knew that because of the relationship, not because of like, I guess I could have pulled the plug, but, but I knew that, I mean, I think that that's what's one of the things that you were brilliant at, you know, right from the start as a little kid, you know, that the creation of relationships and the fostering of those. And, you know, I knew if, if, if there was a picture or if there was a picture up there of, of, of a student giving the finger to a teacher, which, which there was, I could come to you and say, look, uh, dude, I'm getting, I'm getting too much flack for this. I need a favor. Cause you guys, and you always did. And, you know, so it was a, it was a good, it was a good thing. It was a good thing. So anyway, fast forward to the, to the, you feel like your education, both at college at, and and before or after was is crucial to i mean like there are people who no doubt you mean you may not think of yourself that way but like you know you started something that a lot of people know about and su successful and they want they want to be you so so you old 38 year old guy you and 38 know, yesterday yeah really <laughs> 37 we did this two days ago so. oh wow happy birthday Feeling much older thank you <laughs> um so you so you 38 guy talking to you know those kids who want to it's like what do you tell them like what do you what, like what should they do again so recruiting is like the lifeblood of any organization is kind of the the thing that i've learned that i learned in college through my fraternity and that i learned well, right so here. matt what what's next for you i mean i, I don't want to I don't I don't want to get you in trouble with the Weber folks, but but and don't don't tell us anything about what's coming because who knows, but but, you know, you're a talented guy. Are there things noodling around that, geez, it would be great to. No, I mean, I'm I'm having a blast. Uh, I love the June team. I love the Weber team and having a lot and of fun, you, but there you work will, mostly there with the June team. You work mostly still with the June team. You yeah, interface my, with my, the Weber my, team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, but like I was, it was really fun last week. 
uh, we hosted the the Weber CEO and CMO um, and and head of creative uh, all flew out to San Francisco and got to meet a lot of the the June team for the first time and so I got to host him in San Francisco and uh, which was was really really fun to do that to introduce people like Heston and the Weber CEO got to sit next sit next to each other at dinner uh, last week which was really cool yeah. and so th that was a lot of fun um, but yeah I mean I'm having a blast right now but there there will be a time when love to start another company so you would. Uh, that 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 will happen and well, now let me ask you one more question which is just you know if we stop and i haven't asked you this question what well, you haven't had an opportunity to speak about something x what's x or is there an x, x? i don't know i should uh <laughs> go go buy a june oven uh <laughs> juneoven.com check it out i think again i, I don't know what phase of of Food is, Ju habit. is June oven is June oven um is June oven still developing June oven to make it better and better and better and better? Yeah. Or is always, most always. of the shift has gone towards Weber? Yeah, both. There, there's both. a lot of interesting stuff happening on, on both ends. Um, but yeah, depending on what what current diet you're into, David, at one point we we're having this conversation and you were literally my worst customer. I think you were a raw vegan at the time so you weren't even cooking I was never that your your <laughs> vegan food no was, this didn't happen i made this i was up. never that yeah you made that happen. you made that you made that up i mean i i, I could understand why you made that up you've just given, you you've given me this true. illusion over the years of you being yeah. the most extreme food person i know yeah, no, no no i just i'm a breatharian and i live on just air <laughs> that's what it was breatharian yeah All right. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure. So, so Matt, thank you for, thank you so much for giving the time. I know you're a busy guy. It's, are you on the phone all day or Zoom or whatever it is? Are you on screens uh, all day yes, long? Yes, all day. Wow. Yeah. In this phone booth. In this phone booth. In my garage. In your garage, which is <laughs> the best place to be because the commute <laughs> is really good. It is a good commute. Yeah, yeah. Well, Matt, I really appreciate you, you being willing to do this. And uh, but okay. it's good to see you. It's thank, good to thank see you. Thank you so much. You're listening to Curiosity Invited with David Bryan here on LA Talk Radio.